Hello, my name is Spencer, and in my podcast called The Dictionary, I literally read from the dictionary, but add in my personal comments and stupid jokes to make it more interesting. Episodes are family-friendly, short, and air every single day on basically every podcast platform. Come join me on this journey filled with edutainment. Hello and welcome to How Did This Not Get Made. This is the podcast all about the movies you never saw, the scripts that were never written, and the ideas that never even made it to the page. My name is David Spencer. My name is Daniel Kaka. And my name is Tony Goldmark. Well, we are back with Tony, who has been a guest maybe more than anybody else on this podcast at this point. This is my third time. And of course, if Tony's on, then that means, well, I was going to say that means we've got a weird Disney project to talk about, but I guess that really only applies for one other episode. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) You've either got a weird Disney project that never happened or a weird project that I was almost in that never happened. That's true. Those are two of my three big areas of expertise, Disney, me, and Weird Al. Yeah. (laughs) We've never really covered any unmade Weird Al project, although I know there have been some, but there haven't been many details on them. I don't know if you guys remember, like 10, 15 years ago, Al was going to do a made-for-TV movie for Cartoon Network. Oh, Oh. no, I didn't know about this. And then it fell apart at the last minute, and no one knows what the script was going to be. Al's always very tight-lipped about things before they happen, just in case they don't happen. Yeah. Yeah. By all accounts, the Weird Al movie is going to be released because it did finish, so... It's got a trailer already, so it's a done deal. Yeah, thank God that that's not going to be something we have to do an episode on. Thank God, yes. (laughs) So, Tony, the reason why we have you on is because this covers another subject of your specialty, which is... Disney parks and theme parks in general. Mm -hmm. I've been to them a few times. (laughs) (laughs) And more specifically, we are going to be talking about the Haunted Mansion. Now, originally, I was going to title this episode Guillermo del Toro's The Haunted Mansion. But I looked into the subject and it goes beyond just the movie that he did not make. And I realized that this attraction has left a wake of unmade projects, whether it be the original form of the Haunted Mansion and how that was going to be. There was another script that we're going to be discussing as well. And we're going to be talking in depth the Guillermo del Toro one. But before we get into that, Tony, I want to know what is your history with the Haunted Mansion With the ride, maybe the movie. (laughs) Yeah, that subject in general. Well, I was always a big fan of Disneyland. When I was a kid, my mom would take me at least once a year. It was a big thing I looked forward to all the time. As the years went on, I got more and more obsessional with the place, and I started becoming this fountain of obscure Disney trivia. When I became a disgruntled teenager, I lost interest in it. And I was like, "Eh, Disney bullshit. It's just corporate. (laughs) (laughs) And then in my 20s, I kind of got over myself and got back into it because fuck it. It makes me happy. In my childhood, I remember it took me a while to get the courage to actually want to ride the Haunted Mansion because, you know, little kids like, yeah, spooky ghosts, that kind of thing. Yeah. But once I started riding it, I instantly loved it. It's one of my favorite attractions that's ever been built. Across Disney fandom, you'll find that it's one of the big fan favorite attractions, mm-hmm. arguably the big fan favorite attraction in the sense that it's not a thrill ride, so anyone can ride it, but it's got just so much artistry poured into it. It was kind of the last attraction, when you think about it, that Walt personally approved of. Mm -hmm. Hmm. I mean, the actual exterior of the mansion, that facade was built in the early 60s. I want to say something like 61, 62, 63, sometime around there. Mm. The ride didn't open until 69. Mm -hmm. 
So this was always something kind of on the horizon, and no one really knew for a while what the purpose of this big southern palatial mansion in New Orleans Square even was. The ride didn't actually open until three years after Walt Disney's death. At the time, I think there was a lot of uncertainty as to how much longer the studio would last without him. The movies weren't making as much money anymore. You know, they didn't have him guiding them. All the other executives who took over after he died were like, what would Walt have done? They were hired to be yes men for Walt, essentially. So, yeah, so they didn't have a lot of creative vision on their own. Also, Disney World in Florida was a couple years away from opening, and no one knew how well that would be received. Mm -hmm. There was a strong possibility, I think everyone thought, that the East Coast just isn't going to go for the Disney Park, and we've sunk so much money into this that that's going to be a flop, and the whole company won't last any longer. So I think there was a feeling around Imagineering that the Haunted Mansion might be the last big attraction we ever get to make, so you know what, let's just put our all into it. Let's just make it as artistic and ornate and brilliant as possible. And that's why it's become such a classic in the decades since. One ways in which it's unique is that it's technically an original IP. It's Mm -hmm. one of the few remaining Disney rides that's not actually based on a pre-existing movie, at least not directly, although obviously it has influences. Mm -hmm. I think a big part of the fandom for it is there is so many specific things in that ride to point to, whether it's the paintings or the hitchhiker and ghosts or Madame Leota or the way that the cast members are dressed. And there's so much like lore to it as well. It's like the original Star Wars in the sense that, <laughs> you know how literally every fucking thing on screen in the original Star Wars yeah. has like a several thousand word Wikipedia entry devoted to it? <laughs> yep. It's the yeah. same with the Haunted Mansion. Like, I guarantee the Imagineers were not putting this much thought into it, but like every little tableau along the Haunted Mansion has so many fan theories and everyone has a name and people have written all this material about it, most of which I haven't even read. (laughs) I'm a huge Disney Parks fan. My knowledge of the Haunted Mansion only goes so far. And if I'm not mistaken, Disney has even expanded on a lot of that story and lore, like especially with some of the versions overseas, right? Like doesn't the Disneyland Paris one have a whole storyline to it? The Disneyland Paris one, it's interesting because they put it in the Disneyland Paris equivalent of Frontierland. Mm -hmm. Mm. So the Paris Haunted Mansion is like an old decrepit mansion in a Western ghost town. Mm. And that just adds a whole new layer to it. I know, I mean, this doesn't really have much to do with the Frontierland thing, but originally they got Vincent Price to do the narration of the Paris Mansion. And they didn't use it for a while for some reason, but a few years ago they brought it back. Hmm. I think now in Paris it is Vincent Price doing the narration. Is it in French or in English? No, in English. So so I think that might have been it. How could you be sitting on Vincent Price and not be using it? (laughs) (laughs) They released the audio a while back on like a Haunted Mansion souvenir CD. Where hinges creak in doorless chambers, where strange and frightening sounds echo through the halls. Where candlelights flicker, though the air is deathly still, this is Phantom Manor. They have this whole backstory about the mansion in Paris where it was owned by the guy who made his fortune mining in Big Thunder Mountain Railroad. Okay. So they tie mansion into that ride. It's actually called Phantom Manor in France. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they've got all sorts of different permutations of the ride all over the world. I actually noticed while I was making my Haunted Mansion movie video, the Disneyland Haunted Mansion is modeled after a Southern Plantation mansion. Mm -hmm. And the one in Disney World, because that's already in the South, so doing that again wouldn't be exotic enough. They put that in Liberty Square and they made it look like an old colonial mansion. Mm -hmm. So both sides of the Civil War have Haunted Mansions. Interesting, interesting. And as far as I'm concerned, the North still wins because the Disney World (laughs) version is better. (laughs) Disney World version's a little bit better, although we've got the Hatbox Ghost. Oh, Oh, okay. I I don't know if we'll have time to get into the Hatbox Ghost or what that was, but... I do mention the Hatbox Ghost quite a bit, so yeah, we'll, we'll get into it.
the idea of the Haunted Mansion, or at least having a haunted attraction inside Walt Disney's theme parks, it actually predates Disneyland back when Walt was hoping to develop Mickey Park, which was going to be near Disney Studios in Burbank. The first known existence of the idea is in an illustration that can be found in the 1951 park layout. In it, a sketch was created by Harper Goff. The initial idea was to have a crooked road that would veer off from the main street. And the first thing that you notice is a church and a graveyard at the bottom of the hill. The road would continue and would actually lead you to a large dilapidated house that sat on top of a hill, and there would be a walkthrough ghost house attraction. There is speculation that the initial design was influenced by the Sour Castle in Kansas City, Kansas. So in 1920, around when Walt started his new company, Laughograms, with Ubi Works. But one of the first theaters to show their cartoons was the Isis Theater in Kansas City. The theater was managed by Gus Isel, whose family helped build the house for Antoine Philip Sauer. From the unauthorized story of Walt Disney's Haunted Mansion by Jeff Baham, quote, it seems probable that Disney and Isel spent some time considering myths murmured throughout the community about the old sour castle hmm. myths that have over time encompassed tales of buried treasure hidden tunnels four known deaths on the property and glimpses of apparatuses although the hauntings and myths have been debunked the inspiration of the tales planted a seed another possible influence was the old mill ride featured in electric city also located in kansas city which walt frequently visited as a kid the dark ride featured a palm reader and other dark elements. Hmm. The plans to make Mickey Park in Burbank fell through and development for the new location began in Anaheim in 1954. Disneyland opened in 1955 and in 1957 there were plans to build the New Orleans themed area between Frontierland and Adventureland. There would be a thieves market, a pirate wax museum, and a walkthrough haunted house. Love the idea of there just being a wax museum at Disneyland. That feels yeah. <laughs> not the kind of thing that you would see today. <laughs> no. Somehow I feel like the wax museum wouldn't have inspired a series of blockbuster films. Just, <laughs> you need a ride. You need a ride. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, some wax museums have inspired other movies, like movies with, I don't know, maybe Paris Hilton in it. But <laughs> I'm going to give the people what they want. Sensation, horror, shock. Send them out in the streets to tell their friends how wonderful it is to be scared to death. It is also interesting to think about that, though, because wax figures feels like such an old attraction type of a thing and yeah. even going to a wax museum now kind of feels like you're stepping into the past of this was more relevant decades and decades and decades ago i mean i know madame tussauds wax museum has been around since the french revolution it's like 250 years old as an institution yeah. disneyland and walt disney always strikes me as we got to do animatronics we got to be on the cutting edge of technology and that kind of a new thing i imagine that walt was looking at this as like well we don't really have much in the budget and we're already building like 20 other rides that yeah. are here like we're gonna have some parts where like not everything is gonna be a ride wax pirates yeah exactly <laughs> <laughs> when imagineer ken anderson initially designed the haunted mansion he made it to be an antebellum style house based on the shipley lidecker house in baltimore maryland and he thought it should look worn down and rotten, but Walt was against that. He wanted the outside to be tidy and pristine to match the aesthetic of Disneyland and the New Orleans Square. This was likely inspired by the Tivoli Gardens located in Denmark, where no matter what the attraction was, they kept the appearance outside clean. The type of American building that would be the most cursed and haunted is a southern plantation. Yeah. Oh, very much so. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Which, by the way... 
huge missed opportunity of the Haunted Mansion movie that was made not to actually delve into that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I feel like there might have been a draft where that was a little more specific. Yeah. And the Disney executives were like, no, we don't want to. That's too heavy for us. But they did address it in Luck of the Irish. That's true. (laughs) Luck of the Irish was good enough to address fucking slavery. I mean, when the Irish came to America, things were tough. And they had to work at jobs other people wouldn't take. And they didn't get paid what they deserved. Well, at least they got paid. The joke I put in my Haunted Mansion movie video was, is Disney trying to pretend slavery never happened? Again? And then I cut to a poster of Song of the South. (laughs) (laughs) I'm not sure how accurate this quote is, but if you watch the Behind the Attraction, there was a quote from Walt that he said to the Imagineers that he said, quote, we'll take care of the outside and let the ghost take care of the inside. (laughs) Yeah. It's a good quote. Don't know if that's true, but it sounds like a good quote. It sounds pretty great. (laughs) Walt did like the idea of the antebellum style house located in the Louisiana Bayou and thought it could match the ambiance of the New Orleans Square. Walt had assigned Anderson to develop the story for the house. Anderson recently visited the Winchester Mystery House in San Jose, California. He was inspired by a lot of the misleading features in the house, like the stairs that went nowhere and doors that opened up to walls. So yeah, you've been there before. I've only heard about this house and seen the movie, but I feel like that doesn't match what it's like to actually be there. So what was your experience like seeing the Winchester house? Well, I haven't been there since I was a kid, but I used to go Mm -hmm. a few times as a kid. And yeah, they give guided tours of just this crazy ornate mansion with all these, you know, stairs that go nowhere and hidden rooms and doors that just open to a blank wall and stuff like that. It's like this crazy house basically designed by a crazy person who was losing their mind. (laughs) Yeah, It's a neat little tourist trap. I've always really dug it. I was a little surprised when I learned the Haunted Mansion was inspired by it, because when you walk through it, you don't really so much think Haunted Mansion. You just think weirdly designed house. Hmm. I could see how that kind of plays into things like the stretching room and like there's a few things in the architecture of Haunted Mansion that do kind of lend itself to that sort of nonsense design. (laughs) So one of the first ideas was inspired by Bluebeard in which a wealthy pirate kills his wives after they snoop into a secret room. The story of the Haunted Mansion was going to actually tie in with the Pirates Wax Museum. In the spirit of going over media that was not made, we're actually going to go through the original story of the Haunted Mansion and kind of some of the revisions that it went through. The mansion was under the ownership of Captain Gore, or if you go through other (laughs) renditions, he was also Captain Gideon Goralu, Captain Bartholomew Gore, or sometimes Bartholomew Roberts. Previous to becoming a homeowner, he was a ruthless pirate known as Black Bart. He drastically changed his look, leaving his pirating life behind him and adopted the French customs to try to fit in. So what you're saying is, is that he's a reverse steed bonnet? Yes, yeah. (laughs) (laughs) While rubbing shoulders with the Louisiana elites, he falls in love with an 18-year-old girl, Priscilla. They agree to get married and they would live the rest of their lives in Gore's mansion. Gore allowed Priscilla access to the entire house except the attic. But on the night of their wedding, Priscilla sneaks and unlocks the attic with a stolen skeleton key. In the attic, she finds a chest with objects obtained from Gore's pirating days. The captain catches Priscilla. In one script, they fight and Gore throws Priscilla out of a window and into a well. In another, she is killed and her body is locked up in that chest. In the days that follow, she haunts the captain. Along with other ghosts she's conjured up, the captain goes mad and hangs himself. Unfortunately, both of their spirits are now trapped in the house. So as a guest, here's what you would have experienced. As you walk up to the mansion, an attic window would burst open. You would immediately hear a screaming woman and even a woman who's kind of like trying to get out of the house. But then this anonymous arm would just pull her back in. Once you were inside, you would stand in line and it would actually snake up this spiraling staircase. Some parts of the handrails were electrified. And this is just the research I found. It was for a fun gag. (laughs) I imagine it was a low voltage, but like... (laughs) 
that doesn't sound fun. <laughs> yeah. That sounds potentially dangerous. It does, especially on stairs. Yeah. It sounds like a lawsuit waiting to happen. <laughs> I swear, Your Honor, it was for a fun gag. <laughs> it was a goof. <laughs> The queue would end in a portrait room, displaying three paintings of a beautiful young woman, a handsome red-headed man, and the third would be the two of them together. The portrait would then morph. The woman would have a devious smile and the man would have devilish eyes. Behind you, a library shelf would open up like a door and the host Beauregard would guide you through the door. In an empty room, you would see an empty chair and the apparition of Priscilla, who explains that she stole a skeleton key from her husband's study, snuck into the attic, opened a chest in the hopes to find any clues about the stories he's written in his journal. She disappears and you're led into the study. Priscilla continues with her story. In the chest, she found out something terrible about her husband's identity. She then screams. When you enter a hallway, Beauregard tells you that Priscilla is rarely ever seen, but right in front of you would appear Priscilla as a ghost who says, Bartholomew, where, where are, are you, Bartholomew? You? As you pass by the window overlooking a swamp, outside Priscilla is performing a black mass and conjuring up other spirits to join her. In the captain's bedroom, where you see Bartholomew frightened in bed, Beauregard tells you, after a ghastly night, Captain Gore knew no peace. Every unearthly sound struck terror in his heart, and the last time he was seen on Earth was in this very room. And then Priscilla would say, He would have run away, but there was no place for him to hide, for he knew that I would search for him no matter where he might be. I would haunt him to the end of his days. You then enter the final room, the secret room. Beauregard says, well, that's the end of our story. Some say Priscilla had her revenge, that she drove him mad. Maybe someday we'll know what happened to Captain Bartholomew Gore. Thunder crashes and the lightning reveals the captain hanging from a noose. And as you exit through the cellar, there you will find a chest with hair, clothing, and blood spilling out of it. And if you look carefully, you can catch a glimpse of Priscilla Gore's shadow just before you leave. <laughs> Do any other theme park rides ever attempt to do half of the amount of narrative that this ride was attempting to do? <laughs> this is insane. It's so good. It's <laughs> so good. I would love to see this. <laughs> that is a wild amount of story. Like, I'm not saying that as a bad thing. I'm just saying that as a, I can't believe somebody tried to do this. <laughs> Walt was always pushing the envelope of what a ride could and should be. Yeah. So Ken Anderson, he came up with about 14 different scripts, all of them with slight variations and improvements to the story. There was a version where the butler accidentally kills the bride and hangs himself out of guilt. Hmm. The captain's ship sinks and he is unable to make it back for his wedding. The wedding guests celebrate a wedding that never ends. And in a version where the bride is thrown into the well, the water of the well is colored red. And then Priscilla sings this haunting lullaby, which describes the details of her murder. Captain Gore would have also been linked to the Pirate's Wax attraction because he would have been featured as himself, as Captain Gore, as the pirate. He would have been in that museum. Hmm. Nice. It's cool hearing this story because now I'm like, oh, yeah, and that lines up with this thing in the actual ride. Like, you can see where a lot of the seeds started that ended up in the ride that we know now. Yeah, you can kind of, like, pick and choose, like, especially with Captain Gore hanging from the ceiling. Like that's mm -hmm. one of the first things that you see after the stretching room is the, they explain who was hanging in the ride, right? In the actual ride, no, they never explain that. Oh. Honestly, accounts vary on who that actually is supposed to be. In universe, the Haunted Mansion is Gracie Manor. Yes. So I think that's supposed to be Master Gracie, as it were, mm. the master of the house. One of the really cool things about Haunted Mansion is, at least the American versions of the Haunted Mansion, is that there are several different concurrent interpretations of what's actually going on. Hmm. Who killed who and what happened to whom and why these things are happening. Mm -hmm. And the tour guides in particular at both Disneyland and Disney World 
there's always a moment at every tour, or at least specific Disneyland Park and Magic Kingdom tours, where they stop at the Haunted Mansion and the tour guide gives the whole backstory of what happened in the ride. They are encouraged to tell a different backstory every time. They want it to invoke the whole trope of there being a creepy old haunted house in some suburban town somewhere where everybody's got a different piece of the puzzle. Yeah, Yeah. exactly. And no one knows quite what went on, but there's all these different stories that conflict with each other. Mm -hmm. Huh? The one time I went on a Disney world tour, the tour guide went into this elaborate backstory of what happened between master Gracie and his bride to be. And then at the end of the story, he says, that's just one of many interpretations, you know, in some versions Mm. of the story, she killed him. And Some versions of the story she was cheating on, you know, just all these different various interpretations. And that's how they like it. I know David Gansel has talked about this in his Blitztravaganza videos, but that was also kind of the point of the original version of Pirates, where all you see are these tableaus of pirates just doing a bunch of stuff. And it's kind of up to you to piece together the story that's going on, if there even is one. And one of the cool things about the first Pirates of the Caribbean movie was that it was one potential story. Yeah. But the problem was that movie became so popular that they added Jack Sparrow to the ride and they kind of told you what the story was now. Yeah. That's the problem with the ride now is they're holding your hand through it and saying, oh, everyone's after Captain Jack Sparrow. (laughs) Well, (laughs) he just ruined that no one quite knows what's going on version of the story. Anderson, he would eventually leave the project and work on the film Sleeping Beauty. To replace Anderson, Walt hired two notable Imagineers, Rolly Crump and Yale Gracie to develop the ride. Yale Gracie was a key addition to the Imagineers. When he was originally hired by Disney, he was a layout artist for Disney Animation for what seemed like every Disney film made between 1940 and 1956. Seriously, his IMDb is just like looking at a voice actor's IMDb. It is just (laughs) so much in there. He was also a magician at the Magic Castle in Hollywood. Oh, awesome. So he had this knowledge to create optical illusions and special effects Mm, for the ride. Very cool. Rolly Crump was also an animator. He was a in-betweener or a tweener. I don't actually know the name of the (laughs) occupation. I think they're called I think it was just called in-betweeners. Okay. But he was an in-betweener for films like Peter Pan, Lady and the Tramp, Sleeping Beauty, and 101 Dalmatians. He designed many of Disney's attractions for the 1964 New York World's Fair, including It's a Small World and the Tower of the Four Winds Marquee. Rowley was known for making creepy and scary objects that would oftentimes be hidden from Walt when he would come in and check on the attraction. Their efforts were thwarted because Walt would always find his sculptures and ask him what they were. <laughs> <laughs> there was a day where Crump came to his studio and he found Walt sitting in his chair. He thought that he was in trouble and Walt explained that his artwork and figurines were so scary that it kept him up all night. And for sure, Crump was certain that he's going to be kicked off the project. <laughs> <laughs> Walt reassured him that he was going to stay on and his work would actually be featured in a post-show attraction known as the Museum of the Weird. Very carnival <laughs> of an idea. There was also an idea to incorporate a restaurant into the attraction, much like the Blue Bayou at the Pirates of the Caribbean, but the plans diminished after Walt's death. The attraction wouldn't open until 1969, and I know, Tony, you kind of touched on this as well. It also didn't help that Disneyland was handing out pamphlets since 1961 that said the attraction wouldn't open until 1963. Right. On top of that, the exterior facade was completed, so everyone observing would think, it looks finished, so why can't I go inside (laughs) there? The thing is, is that They didn't see the construction that was happening underground and outside of the park's property. Right. The attraction was also featured in the 1965 episode of Walt Disney's Wonderful World of Color. And Mark Davis is the uh, master in charge of our house of illusions or... uh... Uh, what do we call it? Uh, a haunted mansion. Haunted mansion and uh, and uh, supernatural. Oh, lots Can of supernatural. Can you give you a little idea what the, we're going to have in there? <laughs> yes, well, we're doing a lot of portraits that change right in front of your very eyes. As a matter of fact, one of our paintings here is based on Greek mythology. This is Medusa. There was also a rumor that someone got a sneak peek and was literally scared to death. <laughs> that was debunked. 
That's not true. <laughs> a sign was placed in front of the lock gates that read, Notice, all ghosts and restless spirits. Post-lifetime leases are now available in this haunted mansion. Don't be left outside in the sunshine. Enjoy active retirement in this country club atmosphere, the fashionable address for famous ghosts, ghosts trying to make their name for themselves, and ghosts afraid to live by themselves. Leases included license to scare the daylights out of guests visiting the portrait gallery, museum of the supernatural, graveyard, and other happy haunting grounds. For reservations, send resumes to past experience to Ghost Relations Department, Disneyland. Please do not apply in person. <laughs> Ghost Relations. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> The Haunted Mansion seemed to always be a low priority after the park first opened. Another factor that delayed the attraction's progress was the 1964 New York World's Fair, which Crump helped with. After the New York World's Fair, Walt assigned Mark Davis and Claude Coates to direct the attraction. The Imagineers were still planning on making this a walkthrough attraction, but they found the concept that Walt wanted became too complicated for that. On top of that, they were worried that guests going at their own pace would slow down the line. So they considered ghost hosts, character actors that would guide the guests and help move them along. This is when Xavier, or X Atencio, was hired to write a new script for the Haunted Mansion. He also wrote the script for the adventure through inner space, Pirates of the Caribbean, and even wrote the lyrics for Yoho, a pirate's life for me. He also wrote the lyrics to Grim Grinning Ghosts. Yes. Yeah. going to be butlers and maids that guided you through the home in later scripts they considered animals like a one-eyed cat and a raven but when Atencio wrote the script he thought that the host should be more like a greeter and a recording of the greeter would play back as the guests entered the house to voice the greeting they hired Paul Freeze do it once more and kind of whisper this deathly still I don't think it does not any need to uh... KU-6906. When hinges creak in doorless chambers and strange and frightening sounds echo through the halls, whenever candlelights flicker where the air is deathly still, that is the time when ghosts are present, practicing their terror with ghoulish delight. Welcome, Foolish mortals to the haunted mansion. I am your host, your ghost host. <laughs> now, who is Paul Freeze? Who isn't Paul Freeze? <laughs> <laughs> who was it that said he was the voice of a thousand characters? It was like Mel Blank. Mel Blank. That's I think, I think that was Mel Blank's word for himself. Yeah, <laughs> he called himself the man of a thousand voices. But Paul Freeze, yeah, was all over the place, especially in '60s animation. He was the voice of Ludwig von Drake for Disney. Professor Ludwig Globetrotter von Drake. All right. Now, I know the first question you're going to ask is, why a Mediterranean crew? Hmm? Well, it's where our civilization and our culture came from. But culture, schmelcher, this is the place where you can have the most fun. He was... Boris Badenov in the Rocky and Bullwinkle cartoons. He was oh, yeah. actually even going before the 60s. There's a great Spike Jones recording of his cover of My Old Flame. Hmm. <laughs> My old flame. I can't even think of her name. I'll have to look through my collection of human heads. Where Paul Fries does an amazing Peter Lorre impression. Huh. <laughs> you gotta listen to it. It's amazing. <laughs> and of course, Paul Fries has done a bunch of voices for Disney. He also does a bunch of voices on Pirates of the Caribbean. Yes. I know he's the talking skull. <laughs> He was the original auctioneer. Shift your cargo, dearie. Show him your larboard side. And of course, the ghost host in 
Haunted Mansion, just an absolute legend. Yeah. Is that still the same recording they use for the ghost hosts? For the ghost hosts, yes. Mm -hmm. For the main version of Haunted Mansion, yeah, they still use the original Paul Fries recording. Although, for the last 20 years or so, every holiday season, the Anaheim version turns into Haunted Mansion Holiday, where they theme the mansion to Nightmare Before Christmas, which I only have a problem with because by holiday season, they include Halloween. Yeah, it's always so weird to me that the scary ride becomes Christmas themed for Halloween. It's so stupid. When it's Halloween, I want to ride the original Haunted Mansion. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Do the refurb the first week of November and have the Christmas version up for Christmas. Fine. Mm-hmm. But don't take Haunted Mansion away from Halloween, guys. I'm just (laughs) waiting for the Muppets theme one year. Oh, Oh, man. (laughs) I'm sure we'll get to that. But (laughs) have Will Arnett do the ghost host recording. Oh, yeah, absolutely. That'd be great. So the attraction was still going to be walk through and the issue of long lines was still looming. Imagineer Rolly Crump used the idea that he got from the Seattle World's Fair So in the pavilion at the World's Fair, there was an elevator that people could take all the way up to the ceiling. Once the doors opened, the observers would end up in this dark room. And at the other end of the room was a TV that flickered on. So this would naturally draw people to the other end of the room, which would then empty out the elevator pretty quickly. And then to move them along, that TV would shut off. And then another TV down the hallway, that would turn on and that would send people or send the crowd over to that area. So that helped with the crowd control. Mm -hmm. Other ideas were thrown out by putting the Museum of the Weird in the front so the guests wouldn't be bored while waiting in line. And then there was another plan that they were going to make two identical attractions just to send you in different directions, which I guess they're kind of doing now, like especially in Galaxy's Edge. Uh, They have like 10 different Millennium Falcon cockpits that you get directed to. Exactly. But that's a lot easier to do with a pod that moves and has a screen projecting as opposed to an entire ride with animatronics. Yeah. In 1966, Walt Disney unexpectedly passed away. He never got to see the Haunted Mansion to completion. When Dick Nunes took over as the chairman of Disney Attractions, he pushed to increase the capacity inside the attraction and no longer liked the idea of this being a walkthrough exhibit. They first proposed a boat ride where the guests float through a half-sunken, rotten mansion and continue to find a way to connect it to the Pirates of the Caribbean. But the thing is that there were too many boat rides that were already being created in the park, so they decided to go with the Omnimover system. This is where the ride vehicles were in constant motion while guests get on them while walking on a giant conveyor belt. This system was invented by Imagineers Roger Brogy and Bert Brundage for Adventure Through Inner Space. Now with the Omnimover in place, this would change the script again. The guests would be moving too fast for the ghost host, but they tried their best to try and keep that feature in. They even thought about using the Raven as the host, and at the end you learn that the ghost host was a bewitched soul of the bird. Making the attraction a ride rather than a walkthrough was a big wrench that was thrown into the already unstable cogwheels. A new script was written by Mark Davis and Claude Coates. The two of them were consistently feuding with the direction of the attraction. Davis wanted the Haunted Mansion to be family friendly and silly, while Coates wanted the Haunted Mansion to be, well, haunted and scary. Yep. They even broke off into two separate teams working separately on the same ride while Davis and Coates, where they would meet just to debate the ideas, just to see which one was better. They weren't even coming to a compromise. Hmm. They finally agreed to a singular plan when Xavier or X Atencio was able to combine their ideas together. He made the first part of the ride scary, but towards the end, the theme would become more silly. He also cherry picked elements of older scripts that he liked and put them into the ride. He also wrote the lyrics for Grim Grinning Ghosts. Grim Grinning Ghosts come out to socialize. Now the engineers could begin construction for the ride in 1967. This dark ride is uniquely constructed. Even though the ride is called the Haunted Mansion, you never actually go through the mansion. 
When you first walk into the gallery, known as the stretching room, the guests experience a ceiling that appears to be moving away from them while the portraits begin to reveal more than they appear to be at first. In reality, the guests are descending 18 feet and the doors open up and lead you into a queue which would lead you into the loading area. The guests wait in an underground tunnel that goes underneath the railroad tracks. The actual ride takes place in a show building. This is completely out of sight from onlookers. It's hidden behind trees and located behind a restricted area behind the railroad tracks. The ride totals 40,000 square feet with the mansion facade only taking up 5% of that space. Hmm. About a week before the mansion opened, Imagineer Marty Sklar called Dick Irving to help in naming the Omnimovers. The names Seance Conveyance and Ghostmobile were considered, but the winner was the Doom Buggies. Doom Buggies. <laughs> After 15 years of development, the Haunted Mansion officially opened on August 9th, 1969, with over 82,000 guests going through the ride within the first week of operation, a record-breaking number that would not be beaten for another 18 years. Two years later, the Haunted Mansion would open in Disney World in Orlando, Florida. Development for both sites happened simultaneously with duplicates of props and set pieces made for both locations. There were some differences in the two rides, the main being that Disney World is bigger and there's no need to lower the guests into the tunnel. So the portrait room ceiling is actually rising mm. in Orlando compared to the one that's in California. Hmm. Making a connection between the Haunted Mansion and the Pirates of the Caribbean still haunted the Imagineer for years. In the 1990s, they came back to wanting to make that connection, and this time centering it around a real-life pirate, Jean Lafitte. Lafitte was a French-born pirate that operated in the Gulf of Mexico in early 19th century after he and his fleet were captured on the island of Barataria Bay. They fought alongside Andrew Jackson to stop British forces from entering access to the Mississippi River in the War of 1812. Afterwards, he returned back to pirating and his death still remains a mystery. Lafitte's presence has been known in the park since it first opened in 1955. In its first location in Frontierland, you would find Lafitte's anchor with a plaque that read, Lafitte's anchor said to be from a pirate ship commanded by Jean Lafitte in the Battle of New Orleans, January 8, 1815. It is also said that Lafitte's pirateering steps left a wake of blood from the mainland to Barataria Bay, but don't believe everything you read. After New Orleans Square and the Pirates of the Caribbean opened in 1966, the anchor was moved to the more appropriate location. On the Pirate's Ride, there's a Lafitte's Landing, which ties in with the anchor. Actually, if you go there now, you can still find the anchor. So in 1994, Paul Pressler became Disneyland's head executive. Now, do you know anything about Paul Pressler? He's history's greatest monster, essentially, if you, <laughs> if you talk to most Disney fans. When people talk about how the last 10 years or so of the Eisner era were this just dead zone of creative compromises and just horribly watered down cheap attractions, especially at the parks. Paul Pressler is very often an avatar of that mentality. Hmm. The fact that DCA 1.0 was so crappy initially when it opened in 01, Pressler was in charge of that. I'm sure the actual truth is a little more nuanced than this, but mm -hmm. the narrative is that Pressler's whole thing was we got to have as much retail space as possible, as many places to sell things as possible. Mm, yeah. The attractions themselves don't really matter because people will come anyway because it's Disney. Yeah. <laughs> it was precisely the opposite of what people consider what makes Disneyland special, at least among the fans. So yeah, Pressler's not very well liked <laughs> to this day among the Disney fan community, even though Pressler's long gone. When there's a rumor that some attraction currently being built is facing compromises or it won't have as much cool stuff as it was gonna originally, like when they hear that, oh, uh, Galaxy's Edge is cutting a lot of the show elements, like the live show stuff. Yeah. People are still going, man, it's like fucking Pressler's back, you know? <laughs> people still invoke his name. It's like, <Wow>. yeah. <laughs> I found a list of like 
just a few of the things that he did, one of which he had the employees there wash their own uniforms. God damn. <laughs> he would close down rides and shows earlier so that he could like release, well, the staff and then didn't have to pay those operating hours. Ugh. The thing that he got the most hate for was when he discontinued disability discounts. Oh, God. <sighs> yeah. So even though at that time the profits were at an all-time high, the attendance began to drop. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But one of the biggest costs there was actually operating Tom Sawyer Island. More specifically, the river raft ride, or at least the ferry, mm -hmm. the thing that like got them back and forth. On top of that, Tom Sawyer's Island had to be repaired and brought up to code, and he did not want to pay that at all. Mm. Instead of like re-theming the island to be like after pirates, because I don't know if you know, before they had a room, it was like this bunker almost that actually had almost like a wax figurine of Andrew Jackson in it. Hmm. It's kind of weird. Yeah. They have since got rid of that. Although nowadays there is the pirate's lair, right. but that was introduced in 2007. There was considerations that they were going to retheme the island after the real life historical figure, Jean Lafitte. But it was kind of confusing how they got there. Instead of using the expensive river rafts to transport people to and from New Orleans Square to Tom Sawyer Island, they wanted to instead build an underground tunnel, which would be a new path between the two locations. Hmm. That doesn't seem like it would cut costs. That no. <laughs> you're spending a pound to save a penny, I guess. Yeah, yeah. Now, what was going to be interesting, though, is that they were going to make a crypt for Lafitte. Hmm. And plans were to build it across from the Haunted Mansion. And when you entered, it actually led you into a catacomb, which would be built out of the bones of Lafitte's former crew. The catacombs would empty into a shipwreck filled with treasure. To exit, you would go up the stairs. Once you opened up the door, you would actually be on Tom Sawyer's Island. Hmm. Pressler thought the idea was too expensive and shut down the plans, which is why we don't have an underground tunnel today. Yeah. <laughs> the only remnants of these plans can actually still be found at the park today. There is a bricked up archway with a stone at the top that reads 1964. It's located across from the Haunted Mansion, and it's believed to be the entrance to Lafitte's Lost Catacomb. Hmm. 1964 is the year that the Spanish took control of New Orleans, and that's when the first Cajuns arrived in New Orleans. So that's why they kept that date up there. Hmm. As for the connection between the Haunted Mansion, Imagineers came up with a storyline that Ambrose Gracie, the original owner of the house had business relations with Lafitte, revealing that his fortune was tainted in piracy. As opposed to being tainted by slavery? Yeah. <laughs> Just hearing you talk about all this, they tried so hard they did. to establish a connection between pirates and the mansion. And I get it. It is cool that both of these things take place in the same universe. But it just feels so goddamn sweaty, all these things. Yeah. Now I'm imagining getting a Haunted Mansion movie and then in the end tag, Orlando Bloom shows up. <laughs> but even thinking about the Pirates of the Caribbean movie, especially the first one, so much of it is like tied into the supernatural with ghosts, with like yeah. the undead. And just like so much of it is creepy. Whereas on face value, if you go on the Pirates ride, really it's just pirates hanging out in a bay yeah so i want to go into the first movie now the first attempt to making a haunted mansion movie actually dates back to the early 90s with the script that was written by sheila greenberg and jim hill jim hill is a disney historian and has been reporting on disney for about 40 years mm -hmm. in the early 90s jeffrey katzenberg was interested in making a feature film based on a classic Disney theme park attraction rather than making a movie and then theming a ride after that. Just a few months before when Hill had just found out this information, he realized that he had this interview with Imagineer Mark Davis about the original development of the Haunted Mansion ride. So Jim told his writing partner, Sheila Greenberg, that they should try writing a Haunted Mansion script. And from Hill, he said, what the hell? Let's see if Sheila and I can't take these notes and work them up into something that Disney might be interested in producing. So they took the original concept, they fleshed it out into a script, and they turned it into Disney, and somehow 
Disney was actually interested in making this movie. For several months, they were in production meetings, and the possibility of making this into a film were real. And they even met with the Disney's game division to potentially make this into a video game. Oh, that's kind of cool. Yeah. And by the way, I got to talk for a bit about Jim Hill, because like you said, he's been reporting on Disney, you know, ever since the 80s. And of course, when the internet came along, he started a website, which I believe still exists to this day, JimHillMedia.com. I mentioned how when I was in my 20s, I was starting to get back into Disney. This would have been in the mid 2000s. Reading Jim Hill's blogs on his website were a huge part of what increased my obsession with it because he was basically defunct land before defunct land. (laughs) Part of the goal with my show, Some Jerk with a Camera, was just to make funny videos based on a lot of these stories I'd only learned about by reading all of Jim Hill's blogs because he knew people who worked in Imagineering and obviously he would never reveal his sources because he didn't (laughs) want them to get fired. They would tell him and he would relay just all these behind the scenes stories of, oh, why this deal didn't really work out or why this attraction was never built or like stuff about how Alien Encounter that used to be a Disney World. Oh, you're right. <laughs> the Alien in Alien Encounter was originally going to be the Xenomorphs from yeah. the Alien franchise and why that didn't happen and all the complications that arose from that not happening and them having to base it on this new original story. Jim Hill would write these long articles about all these Disney rides, which to this day still influence Disney fandom. Whenever you see some of these behind the scenes videos from people like Defunct Land, it's like I watch them. It's like, yeah, a lot of the info just comes from old Jim Hill blogs. Yeah. So Interesting. You read the Wikipedia pages of a lot of Disneyland and Disney World attractions, and a lot of the sources they cite are Jim Hill. Yeah, actually, a lot of what I learned about the Haunted Mansion came from Jim Hill and his reporting. Absolutely. Once I discovered him, it just like opened up this entire world of Disney for me. Now, do you know how Disney feels about Jim Hill? Are they like pro Jim Hill or they're just like, uh, yeah, we don't really like pay attention to him, even though he's constantly talking about us. <laughs> yeah, they take kind of a stance of non-involvement with the guy nowadays. I mean, obviously, back in the 90s, they were developing a script with him that he was writing. But I think once the internet came along, they were like, okay, maybe not. Although I do know that when they were making the Country Bears movie, the first movie ever based on a Disney park attraction, they actually reached out to the Disney fan community to be extras in the big Mm -hmm. Country Bears comeback show scene at the very end of the movie. And I know Jim Hill is an extra in that scene. Very cool. Just because of the Disney Park connection, along with a bunch of other Disney Park vloggers at the time. Hmm. But as for how they feel about Jim Hill revealing all this info, they neither confirm nor deny any of it. (laughs) They don't have to, obviously. I'm sure there's legal implications with it. Also, I think they know if we try to shut this guy down, it's not going to look good for us. So, And ultimately, he's probably driving more business to Disneyland anyway. Oh, yeah. I think they take the same stance with him that they took with Escape from Tomorrow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, about how, look, it's better for us if we just ignore this guy. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Not to diss the guy or anything, but I have heard that not all his stories that he's reported on are entirely accurate. Hmm. I read one Imagineer once say, yeah, Jim's a nice guy. (laughs) And he basically put it like that. I don't want to dump on Jim Hill because he's a nice guy, but some of his stuff is a little questionable. All right. So what I'm going to get into now is the actual plot synopsis. Now, I will say, because we were talking about Jim Hill, on his website, he has actually, I don't want to say leaked the script, but he's basically published the script on his own. So if you do want to read the script... It is out there for you to read. And it's actually like a really good read. I mean, we're also comparing this to the only Haunted Mansion movie that's out there. So sure, almost anything made about the Haunted Mansion is going to be better. <laughs> One of three Haunted Mansion movies, if you count Muppets Haunted Mansion. And, yes. <laughs> and four if you wait till next year. So. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so we open on a large crystal ball. Madame Leota appears and brings us back in time where it all began. We are at Chesapeake Bay, Maryland, 1893. Captain Bloodworth and his crew successfully plunder a freighter of their goods before setting it on fire. He orders his crew to lay low after this raid 
and doesn't want the news spreading. Three weeks later, at the Gracie Mansion in Green Hill, Maryland, this was something that I also found weird is that they set it in Maryland and not New Orleans. So we're in the north now. It's the Disney World version of it. Yeah, I think so. I think Jim Hill's an East Coast guy. Oh, that That's probably sense. why. <laughs> The mansion is located on the river's edge by the town's cemetery. A wedding is about to take place between Jacob Gracie and his business associate's 20-year-old daughter, Kathleen Fowler, after a 10-day long engagement. When we first see Jacob, it's clear to the audience that he is Captain Bloodworth. Kathleen and Clarence, who is Kathleen's father, are hesitant about the marriage. After the Fowler's shipping business was under attack from Bloodworth and his pirates, Clarence has accrued an unfortunate amount of debt that Jacob had agreed to take care of after the wedding. Kathleen spots her friend Charles Davis and runs out of the room to greet him. Jacob intervenes. Charles reveals to Kathleen and the wedding guests that Jacob is indeed Bloodworth the pirate. He's here to arrest him. Kathleen throws her engagement ring at Jacob. Jacob retaliates by pushing her hard down the stairs, killing her instantly. Charles retaliates, but is met with a sword cane to the chest. He is also killed. Jacob, just before he could reach the escape hatch in the staircase, he is shot by the constable. Before he dies, he curses the house saying, with my last dying breath, I curse you to stay trapped in my mansion till Kate's wedding day. Now, I want to interject another thing here. Yeah. I didn't get a chance to reread this script in preparation for this podcast, unfortunately, but I did read this script several years ago. And one thing I remember from it is that practically every character is named after an Imagineer huh. or someone who worked for the parks at some point. Like, for example, Fowler, you just mentioned, that's named after Joe Fowler, who was the general manager of Disneyland for its first 10 years. There's other references to Joe Fowler. The dock for the two large ships in Rivers of America at Disneyland across from the Haunted Mansion is named Fowler's Harbor. Huh. I just noticed while reading the script, even if I didn't know who Jim Hill was, I would think, okay, this guy's obviously a massive Disneyland fanboy because not only are the names all named after Imagineers, but also I think in the script it says the Haunted Mansion is on Harbor Boulevard, mm. oh. which is, of course, the street Disneyland is on. I think it's even like 1313 Harbor Boulevard, which I think is Disneyland's address officially. Yeah, this is like riddled with it. I didn't ever realize that. That's super cool. There's all sorts of Disney Park in-jokes in this script. So That's awesome. Kathleen's four-year-old sister, Julia, she witnesses the massacre. Her image disappears into the crystal ball, and we pan out to reveal a 104-year-old Julia in Green Hill's rest home. She is talking to a gypsy, a full-bodied Madame Leota Crump. Again, a reference to Raleigh Crump. Yep. <laughs> the owner of Madame Leota's Museum of the Weird, and she owns a large crystal ball. Julia is telling her about the awful day and that her father hung himself soon afterwards. She explains that Jacob cursed everyone at the wedding, souls trapped forever in the mansion, and she's the last one to survive and is bound to the house, and she needs her help. From the home, we can actually see the mansion, which is now dark and decrepit. A storm begins to brew. We are introduced to two teenagers, a volunteer named Shauna, and a juvenile delinquent, Will, who was arrested for hotwiring a school bus. The ghost of Jacob Gracie appears before Julia and the two teenagers and disappears when a doctor arrives. The three are in shock, Julia nearly scared to death. Leota begins a spiritual ritual to help save Julia's soul. Julia passes away. She's about to pass into the next life, but the ritual is interrupted by Jacob, who traps Julia's soul in a doll and takes it back to his mansion. Leota, Will, and Shauna take Leota's van to get to the mansion. At the cemetery, the groundskeeper Justin Jorgensen and his dog Queenie encounter Baxter, a ghost and the mansion's old kennel master, who scares them off. Two other ghosts appear, Mumford and Gordon, the butler and livery man. Is it supposed to be delivery man? No, it's not. It actually says livery man, and I looked it up, and it is basically the guy who takes care of the horses. Huh. Never heard that before. I've never heard that either, which is why I looked it up. Because I thought it was a made-up word, or I thought it was like, did they misspell delivery man? No, <laughs> delivery man is a thing. Mumford and Gordon, they are scolding Baxter for haunting before midnight. 
Jacob arrives back to the mansion and tasks the three of them to guard the house from the three mortals. The three mortals drive up to the mansion with bolt cutters. They try to open the chained up gate. The ghosts reset the chain, and after a tug of war with the chain, Leota lights a flare, fooling the ghosts to think that it's C4 that can also harm ghosts. <laughs> this buys them enough time so they can get into the van and just ram the gate. After telling the ghosts that they're here to rescue Julia's soul, they agree to help them sneak in and steal the doll. While in the cemetery, Jacob is hoping to bargain with Kathleen using Julia's soul and lures her back to the mansion. Leota, Shauna, and Will enter the dark mansion with the help of the ghosts Mumford, Gordon, and Baxter. The mansion has not changed since the day of the wedding, except it's decayed and covered in cobwebs. They enter the sitting room where Will discovers a ship in a bottle. It's Bloodworth's ship, which seems to be magically sailing through a storm. In the portrait room, the eyes of the paintings seem to follow any of the intruders in the room. They encounter two ghosts, Craig and Claude Sewell, in the midst of a duel. In the banquet hall, they find Mrs. Blair forever celebrating her birthday. Baxter asks for a slice, but the cake disappears before he gets a chance. Turns out Mrs. Blair died because her son poisoned the cake. So it seems like any of the ghosts that are bound to the house, even though they might have died outside of the house, however they died, they're basically reliving that instance inside of the house over and over and over again. They enter the library, which connects as a single room to the conservatory. There they find an ancient manuscript titled Secrets of the Arcane the book Jacob used to curse his guests. In it, Shauna discovers a spell that transfers a soul into an object. Will accidentally bumps into a bus, which awakens four bus who all begin to sing. Where's the key? Where's the key? Where's the beautiful key? Find the key, find the key, oh, how happy you'll be. Jacob is now aware of their presence. Jacob throws the mortals through the glass windows of the conservatory and into a river. Unfortunately, Leota lands on a dock and is severely injured. Kathleen enters the library, pleading to let Julia free. Jacob agrees, but only after the wedding, which will be tonight. Jacob throws out the three ghosts who betrayed him and with his magic repairs the broken glass and shuts all the doors and windows throughout the mansion and magically sealing the house. Kathleen had no idea that Jacob was this powerful. Leota is too injured to go on, so she has Shauna bind her soul to the crystal ball she's been carrying around in her carpet bag. The six of them can't get back into the house, so Baxter suggests going through the secret passageway through the boathouse. On their way, Leota discovers a way to levitate and move on her own. The boathouse is guarded by two ghostly dogs that greet Baxter cheerfully when they arrive. They all enter the secret tunnel through the back of the boathouse. In it, a floating candelabra leads the way and leads them to the master's treasure trove where they discover the stolen imparts from Clarence Fowler's ship. They find a panel that leads them back into the house embedded in the staircase. They peek out to see that preparations for the wedding have begun. The gang goes up through the servant's staircase and into the attic where they find Kathleen and Clarence, who is hanging by a rope. They talk about Jacob's dark magic and his blackmail plot, just in case he went to the bathroom during the movie. But then <laughs> Leota knows how to stop the wedding. She doesn't reveal her plan to the audience, but tells the servant ghost to stall the wedding. The wedding preparations are nearly finished, and we get to see Mr. Baker playing wedding music at the pipe organ. Jacob arrives, placing the quartet bus next to Mr. Baker to sing with him. Jacob keeps Julia's doll and his sword cane on him at all times. Reverend Ryman arrives to perform the ceremony, followed by Kathleen and her father Clarence, who are about to walk down the aisle with Jacob at the other end. The organist begins to play Take Me Out to the Ball Game, which was Baxter's doing of trying to delay the wedding, and the quartet decides to sing along with this. Jacob is furious and switches the sheet music. To further delay, Kathleen and Clarence are moving very slowly, and Baxter has his dogs steal Jacob's cane. I love that this is sounding like the ride starting off spooky and then getting sillier yeah. Yeah, towards yeah. the end. Meanwhile, 
Leota, Shauna, and Will make their way to the cemetery and find the grave of Charles Davis, the man who nearly arrested Captain Bloodworth in the first act, and perform a seance, which frightens the groundskeeper Justin and his dog Queenie. And their plan is to get Charles back to the wedding to hopefully stop it. They also inform him about the blackmail and all that stuff. Jacob, who now has his cane back, is irate and threatens to destroy the doll if there are any further delays. As the Reverend asks if anyone objects to the marriage, Charles bursts in with a loud, I do. Jacob stabs him again, but Charles is a ghost, so it doesn't affect him. But ghosts can punch each other, which Charles does to Jacob, <laughs> causing him to drop the doll. Charles kisses Kathleen and tells everyone that if they want to be free, they must fight Jacob to get it. Jacob runs through the portrait gallery where the dueling brothers instead point their pistols at Jacob. Jacob runs away. The two brothers then forgive each other. Jacob barricades himself into the library and magically seals the doors. The trap souls cheer. Mumford hands Julia's soul doll to Kathleen, but they are still trapped until Leota finds a loophole in the spell. It did not specify that Kathleen needed to marry Jacob, but that Kathleen only needed to marry. So Charles and Kathleen decide to get married. In the library, Jacob searches through the spell book and finds Convocation, the power to summon doomed souls from the pits of hell. Out of the fire pit, through a portal from hell, emerges Captain Bloodworth's former crew. Hmm. Again, the Reverend asks if anyone has any objections, and at that moment, ghost demon pirates burst through the library door to attack the wedding. You never go wrong with ghost pirates. <laughs> or pirate ghosts. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they reclaim the doll, and they capture the mortals and the bride. Jacob finds Madame Leota so that he can break the crystal ball and destroy her soul. The fight choreography in the script is actually really well laid out. It reminds me a lot of like, I don't know if you read the script for Pirates of the Caribbean and the way that Terry Razio and Ted Elliott, like the way that they write fight scenes is so well choreographed. And that's why they can like put in so many like weird quips into their dialogue because like it fits the action. It's probably also why those movies have such fantastic set pieces. So creative in their use of space and everything. I mean, we talked about this when I covered the first Pirates movie as well but you know they can build the set pieces around the fight choreography already laid out in the script as opposed to you know having the fight choreographers do their thing and the set designers do their thing separately and you don't know if it's going to combine because all George Lucas put in his script was they fight <laughs> <laughs> so it was really interesting to see like this whole thing was laid out and it was like laid out really well and unfortunately because we're doing a synopsis I can only say like you know, they fight, sure. but they fought well. <laughs> Using the spell Shauna learned earlier, she chants it again, this time focusing it on the pirates and Bloodworth, sending them into the bottled pirate ship in the sitting room, brought to her by Will. Charles and Kathleen are finally married. Julia is freed from the doll, and the Fowlers have a reunion. The spirits fly out of the front door and into the night. Julia gives Shauna her doll before she leaves with her family. Mrs. Blair rolls in with her cake and the quartet begins to sing happy birthday. Baxter finally gets a chance to eat some cake. Some of the ghosts decide to stay in the mansion. Now that Jacob is gone, this will be a much more pleasant place to spend eternity. Leota puts out a call to the spirit world, inviting other ghosts to join them to make this their home for wayward spirits. One of the spirits that arrives is a knight in shining armor with a disembodied head tucked under his arm. Will and Shauna leave, promising Madame Leota that they would come back to visit. Leota's van, which is recently fixed up by Gordon, is given to Will and Shauna. Will drives the van since he has that experience from hot wiring the bus. And as the two of them drive away, Baxter decides to hitch a ride with them. Gordon and Momford chase after him. The groundskeeper Justin and his dog Queenie get one last scare from the ghosts. The camera then pans to the haunted mansion as we see more ghosts entering the home. The end. The ending of this really sounds like the setup for a Cartoon Network series. Yeah. <laughs> Just like this home for ghosts. <laughs> the way I see it is like they set it up to be the haunted mansion ride that you go in today. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. 
I mean, that's the premise for the ride originally back in the 60s when they were first promoting it. They wayward home for ghosts. Yeah, yeah, that's true. That's true. I remember when I first read that script, this script at least gets it that the movie's supposed to end with the mansion still being haunted because the 999 happy haunts are happy. Yeah, they yeah. They enjoy being ghosts. They enjoy haunting this house. They're living their best afterlife, as it were. <laughs> and that's one thing the Haunted Mansion movie really fucked up is that at the end, it's treated as a happy ending that the mansion's no longer haunted anymore, that all these ghosts all get to ascend to heaven like it's a fucking pure flicks movie. <laughs> <laughs> that missed the mark there, but like this is why I really enjoyed this script because like it had that setup of ghosts are still here. Madame Leota is still there in the mansion. So like when you visit the ride, you're just like, oh, cool. This is just like the movie, but like in the aftermaths of the movie. Right, right. I don't know if they actually signed her, but I know that there were in talks with Bette Midler oh. to play Madame Leota in this version of the movie. Another glorious morning. Makes me sick. In fact, based on who you ask about it, I've heard one version of the story where the reason they didn't make this movie is because Bette Midler was attached to play Madame Leota and Hocus Pocus had flopped. Mm. Yeah. And of course, this was before Hocus Pocus became this revered cult classic. So they thought, eh, no one wants to see a spooky movie with Bette Midler. You know, yeah. so. <laughs> yeah. Hocus Pocus is partially to blame. So when the movie premiered in theaters, which I didn't realize it was a, it actually premiered in theaters, oh, but yeah. Yeah. that makes sense now. But yeah, it premiered in theaters in 1993 and it tanked. Mm, yeah. Katzenberg didn't want to risk making another supernatural horror family comedy, so he shelved it. But in 1997, Greenberg and Hill, they got a call from their agent at Coast to Coast Talent stating that Disney was interested again, but not making it into a theatrical movie, but a TV movie instead for the wonderful world of Disney with the expectations that it would be released in the fall of 1998. The movie would be produced by Keystone Productions. It's the same production company that made Air Bud. <laughs> and they got a check for their script. And then nothing happened again. Turns out it was because of Tower of Terror, which premiered in October 1997. ABC didn't think the ratings were high enough, so they did not want to make another spooky movie based on a Disneyland ride. Hmm. Eh, what are you going to do? <laughs> <laughs> in spring of 2000, Disney was yet again interested in bringing to the silver screen three Disney park attractions, the Country Bears Jamboree, <laughs> Pirates of the Caribbean, and... The Haunted Mansion. Leading the charge was Brigham Taylor, Walt Disney's studio vice president of production, and Nina Taylor, president of Buena Vista Motion Pictures Group. Instead of using the far superior Hill Green screenplay, Taylor and producer Andrew Gunn wanted a page one rewrite. And who better to pen the screenplay than writer of Elf, David Berenbaum. Now, I don't blame him necessarily for the bad story because it actually took him several months just to create the treatment for this. Hmm. At least a treatment that's Disney Studios liked. And then it took him two more years to write the script. Wow. Yeah. So I think what it was is that he was being bombarded by like producer notes and he just had to put it to paper so i honestly do not blame him for the actual script i know i saw the eddie murphy haunted mansion when it first came out and i do not remember a lot about it but i feel like based off of what i do remember it makes a lot of sense that it was over noted and overwritten there's just like too many weird things that don't mesh in that movie. Yeah. I did three whole videos on that movie back when I did Some Jerk with a Camera. I did them as collaboration with Count Jacula and the Horror Guru. And then when I was on Channel Awesome for a while and I was in Chicago to shoot the uh, Sorcerer's Apprentice co-review that I did with Doug Walker, mm -hmm. we also recorded a Real Thoughts vlog with Doug and Rob Walker, just kind of a podcast, but as a video just giving our real thoughts on the Haunted Mansion movie. So I've talked about the Haunted Mansion movie more than pretty much any movie, with the possible exception of Country Bears. Wow. <laughs> more than what is recommended as a healthy amount of... Uh... <laughs> not a lot I can add to this particular discussion of it. Yeah, it's not very good. <laughs> I mean, the decision to cast Eddie Murphy in a Haunted Mansion movie 
never made any sense to me. Hmm. I know on the DVD commentary, they tried to play it off as, well, you know, it's like we're doing Abbott and Costello meet Frankenstein. Yeah. That kind of thing where we've got a really funny guy in this really spooky environment. I mean, a couple problems with that. First of all, Eddie Murphy isn't funny in the movie. Yeah. The way I put it in my in Some Jerk episode was they just have him talk a lot in character as you know jim evers of evers and evers real estate they reason that if eddie murphy just never stops talking he'll say something funny eventually (laughs) but he never actually does he's just kind of annoying and never shuts up absolutely not let me tell you something fucking christ Deadpool didn't what talk this much! Want? Eddie Murphy was still capable of greatness. I mean, this was only a few years after movies like Nutty Professor and Bowfinger, both of which he was very, very funny in. To have to do this amongst the Haunted Mansion, which is already a property with so much going for it and so much potential. I mean, when you first hear that Disney is basing movies off of their attractions, Haunted Mansion seems like the most perfect fit. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Certainly a lot better of a fit than the Country Bears Jamboree. Yeah, even with their original attractions, technically Pirates, Jungle Cruise, Haunted Mansion are all original IPs, but they're all basically based off of tropes from movies that the Imagineers loved that Disney wasn't necessarily making. Like Jungle Cruise was just based on the African Queen. The Pirates of the Caribbean was based on like Errol Flynn swashbucklers of the 30s and 40s. In particular, a movie Chris Nebergall recommended called Captain Blood. And Haunted Mansion was, of course, based on spooky haunted house movies like The Haunting. When it came time to make movies based on those attractions, the obvious play there is, well, just, you know, make another movie in the vein of the movies that inspired the ride. Yeah. That's why the first Pirates movie worked so well is that it wasn't necessarily trying to be an adaptation of the ride, because how do you adapt a ride that's just a series of tableaus? It was a throwback to old time golden age of Hollywood swashbucklers. And that's why it worked so damn well. But with Haunted Mansion to instantly inject Eddie Murphy in there and, oh, we're going for like Abbott and Costello meets Frankenstein. Well, I kind of don't want that from a Haunted Mansion movie. I just want an old school haunted house movie. I don't want Eddie Murphy just quipping all over the place in that thing. It seems like it does the opposite thing of the ride and the first script is that it starts off being really goofy and silly and then gets spooky at the end as opposed to starting off spooky and then being more lighthearted with those spooky elements. That is true. I know that when Eddie Murphy came aboard, like he's one of those name above the title movie stars who if he wants something changed in the script, it's going to be changed. And so that threw a lot of monkey wrenches into the story process. Like, I know originally, I think his character was going to be a lawyer for some reason, and they changed it to a real estate agent. One of Eddie Murphy's big 80s stand-up specials, I think it was Delirious. Eddie Murphy had that bit about haunted house movies and how, you know, why don't they just leave? Oh, yeah. (laughs) time, Eddie Murphy was developing a horror movie vehicle for himself based on that bit, because I guess he didn't learn a damn thing from Vampire in Brooklyn. (laughs) (laughs) He was trying to develop that movie and ship it around. And at the same time, Disney was working on their Haunted Mansion movie, and they kind of combined the two projects. But the thing is, there's nothing from that initial bit that really remains in the movie, except for When Eddie Murphy finds out the house is haunted, he instantly tries to leave. He tries to get his family together and run like hell out of there. But it's not presented as a joke in the context of the movie. It's just presented as the natural thing his character would do at that moment. It's a logical beat, not a funny beat. Fun fact, by the way, that same Eddie Murphy bit, particularly the moment where the voice says, get out. That was one of the inspirations for Jordan Peele's Get Out. Oh, I'm not surprised. Yeah. Or at least that was the inspiration to title it Get Out. So the same bit inspired both one of the best horror movies of all time (laughs) and the fucking Eddie Murphy Haunted Mansion movie. (laughs) (laughs) One last thing I want to put in here just because I didn't know where this would fit at all. But I did want to mention that one of the chairs used in the Haunted Mansion movie 
is now on the Pirates of the Caribbean ride. It's actually one of the chairs that Captain Jack Sparrow sits on was used from that oh, movie. Huh. The animatronic at the end where Jack's in that big treasure room. Yeah, he's sitting on one of the ornate chairs from the Haunted Mansion movie. It's a, hmm. it's a neat tidbit. Yeah, the two continue to be intertwined. Oh, yeah. <laughs> When the Guillermo del Toro movie was announced all the way back at Comic-Con 2010, it came at the end of, I believe, the Tron Legacy panel, which Patton Oswalt hosted. And then at the very end of the Tron Legacy panel, Patton says, well, we got another special guest coming here to talk about another different project that you all might be interested in. And they bring Guillermo del Toro on and he announces he's doing a Haunted Mansion movie. And during his bit about, you know, we're going to do this, we're going to do that, we're going to make it a straight up horror. It's not going to be a comedy. It's going to be a horror film. And Guillermo del Toro just straight up says, we're not returning Eddie Murphy's calls. <laughs> <laughs> We are not returning Eddie Murphy's calls. <laughs> and that gets a huge response from the Comic-Con audience. Like, yay, that movie sucked. And then Patton at that moment, as a funny bit, just throws down his notes and storms out. <laughs> oh. <laughs> and then comes right back. Amazing. In my research, I did try and watch the Haunted Mansion movie. It took me two attempts. <laughs> To finally finish it, it was pretty hard to get through. But Tony, I did watch your three-part series on the Haunted Mansion twice mm. because I enjoyed it so much more than the movie. <laughs> <laughs> Why, thank you. We mentioned that Guillermo del Toro, during Comic-Con on July 22nd in 2010, that's when he made the announcement that he was actually writing and producing the Haunted Mansion movie, which was then accompanied by the trailer. Not really a trailer, just a little teaser where they showed the logo for the proposed movie. Del Toro at the time did not know if he was going to be able to direct the film because he was in the middle of developing another project, which is another film that we're going to cover later in this podcast, which is Mountains of Madness. He would help develop the story, but to write the actual script, he hired his mimic writing partner, Matthew Robbins. Prior to the announcement, Del Toro was helping the development of The Hobbit, An Unexpected Journey, in which he left in May 2010. The Haunted Mansion film came about when Disney executive Brigham Taylor flew down to New Zealand to discuss development for Don't Be Afraid of the Dark, a horror thriller Del Toro was producing for Miramax. This is back when Disney still owned Miramax. Well, I think they still do. They just don't use it anymore. They just let it die. Yeah. <laughs> Probably for the best. Yeah. Taylor brought up the idea of redoing Haunted Mansion, something he discussed with Disney executive Sean Bailey, and Del Toro perked up. Del Toro was hoping that Disney would wait until he was done with The Hobbit, but when he left in May, that all changed. There were multiple production delays with The Hobbit, and Del Toro had to get back to work on Mountains of Madness, and now Haunted Mansion. Guillermo's fascination with the Haunted Mansion began when he first rode the ride when he was three, and now he claims he goes on the ride at least once a year as a form of therapy. Quote from Del Toro. This is a place where I go to when I need to think or I need to relax and unwind. Uh, when we were going through the worst uh, process of Mimic in 1997, uh, we were doing posts in Los Angeles and I would go on the weekend and ride it over and over again. And to me, I'm in my mad cave, my, my little house that I have for my crap. I said crap already, <laughs> but it's semi-decent. Uh, I have my own haunted mansion room with the gargoyles, the wallpaper, original art by Mark Davis. I didn't realize how into the Haunted Mansion Guillermo del Toro was. Oh yeah, huge fanboy. Along with him being just a world-class filmmaker, made him the perfect person to make a Haunted Mansion movie. Oh yeah. Guillermo del Toro's filmmaking is that perfect blend of genuine horror and not necessarily campy, but being fun with the idea of monsters and everything. Absolutely, absolutely. It was after Bailey and Taylor had a meeting with Dotoro in that very room that they went forward with the development for the movie. Which, I mean, if you're going to convince any producers that you're perfect for a movie <laughs> is by having it set in a room that you made yourself of memorabilia from that ride. Yeah. Now, the script has not been leaked, and I'm still looking for it. But it has been known that the Hatbox Ghost was going to be featured in the film and would be portrayed by Del Toro's muse, Doug Jones. Mm, yes. And that is the Hatbox Ghost. Yeah. I always uh, I always love his image. 
I think is one of the scariest creations, but it's also incredibly whimsical. And uh, what I decided was that, uh, you know, in the talks with Disney, that this would be the pivotal character to reintroduce the, the mythology. Now keep in mind that the Hatbox Ghost was removed shortly after the ride in 1969 because the lighting didn't work and didn't actually return until 2015. So only the real fans of Haunted Mansion would actually understand this reference. Yeah. The effect of the Hatbox Ghost, it was this ghost that was holding a hatbox in his hand and his head would constantly disappear and reappear in the hatbox and then disappear from the hat box and reappear on his shoulders. The effect in 1969 just never quite worked. They couldn't get the lighting to work. There were times when it looked like he just had another head in his bag, and, or he was just headless and was holding an empty hat box. It didn't work, and they very quickly removed it from the ride shortly after it opened, or maybe even before it opened, you know, back when it was just open to preview audiences here and there. The hat box ghost appeared in a lot of early... Haunted Mansion promotion. It was described in the Haunted Mansion record album. They released a record album for Haunted Mansion where two kids, a boy and a girl, uh, sneak into this Haunted Mansion. And by the way, the boy is voiced by a young Ron Howard. Hatbox Ghost. And of course, this was before the internet existed. So there was never any proof that the Hatbox Ghost was actually mm. in the ride at any point. It was this thing that some people remembered who were there early enough, but they couldn't prove that it actually was there. And it became this fascinating bit of Haunted Mansion lore among the super fans. They would have these heated debates of whether the Hatbox Ghost ever actually existed. Even in Imagineering, they weren't quite wow. sure. Hmm. I mean, Tony Baxter eventually at one point kind of made it his mission to prove or disprove that the Hatbox Ghost was ever a thing. <laughs> he eventually had to go into the archives and thumb through a bunch of receipts for mm. animatronics built and not built. And eventually he found one for the Hatbox Ghost, proving that it was in fact in the ride. And that was kind of a big deal amongst the fans at the time. That's super interesting. But the cult of the Hatbox Ghost eventually grew so much that, like you said, in 2015, they did in fact return Hattie as he's called by the fans back to the ride because now the technology does exist to do that effect justice. Although I have to say now it's done with just like screens, right? Like LCD screens. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And it is not as magical to me as seeing the dinner party effects or like <laughs> how I imagine they tried to do it. And I understand that you would have to do it with the screens. There's a part of me that wishes we saw something a little bit more practical with it. The way I see it, Hatbox Ghost is better than no Hatbox Ghost. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Speaking of that divide between old school effects and new school effects, the Hitchhiking Ghosts effects, which in Anaheim is still the old school, like Pepper's Ghost mirror thing that it shows up in your thing. But in Florida, a few years ago, they recently changed it so that it's like this animated ghost, like fly into the mirror effect and they screw around with you. And it's animation. But like you said, it feels a lot more artificial that way. Yeah. But I will say the one big upside of them changing it in Florida is that because they no longer had any use for the animatronics that they used that you never actually saw on the ride. You just saw kind of their reflections like Pepper's Ghost, like I said. But a few years ago, there was a traveling museum exhibit of stuff from the parks and those original hitchhiking ghost animatronics were revealed to the public for like the mm, first time. That's Ooh. cool. But I got to see them up close on that thing. So that was really awesome. But that was a big thing that Guillermo del Toro wanted. To, and in fact, I feel like the development of that script might have been what inspired the Imagineers to bring Hattie back to the ride was that he really wanted to focus it on the Hatbox ghost. Huh, that makes sense. So from Del Toro, he actually talked about what the story was going to be about. Quote, there are several mansions around the world, 
and he is the spider in the center of the web of these mansions around the world. And he will be a pivotal figure in the screenplay. The look of the film would be a visually stylized world and not just the mansion, but a heightened reality mixed with the original art and Del Toro's visual style. Quote, it's going to be a thrill ride for the whole family, but it's definitely going to be scary. Also, the film was rumored to be shot in 3D, which in this case, I'm actually okay with seeing this film in 3D. Yeah. Guillermo del Toro has always been one of those people who likes to do those different film formats, right? Yeah, I think so. So the film entered development hell with del Toro claiming that he couldn't manage to crack the story. During a Reddit AMA to help promote The Strain, he revealed that he was on the third or fourth draft and was actually working with two different writing teams. In June 2011, Imagineer Jason Surreal was brought on as a creative consultant. A bunch of concept art was created and a few maquettes of the Hatbox Ghosts were made. In August 2012, Del Toro submitted the final draft with the intent that this would be a PG-13 rated movie. A year later, he announced that he would not be able to direct the film, but he would stay on as a producer and be credited as a co-writer. This is around the time that he began making Crimson Peak. I understand why Del Toro stepped back to only be the producer because he had a lot of projects that were up in the air. Two films that were being developed, which ended up not getting made, were Mountain of Madness and Justice League Dark. He was also just finishing Pacific Rim. He directed the pilot episode for The Strain. He was also working on his book, Cabinet of Curiosities. And also he was the executive producer of Kung Fu Panda 3. (laughs) Yeah, you wouldn't want to divert his attention away from that. (laughs) (laughs) Never, never. Over at Disney, the film continued to be developed in D.V. DeVinci's He wrote Gross Point Blank and High Fidelity. He was actually hired to rewrite the script. In April 2015, it was announced that Ryan Gosling was going to be cast in the film. Gosling and Del Toro have developed a friendship after moderating a panel at the South by Southwest about the making of Lost River. Later, the two of them were caught at Disneyland during the (laughs) weekend of the Oscars, which they did not attend. (laughs) The latest news from the film was from an interview from producer Brigham Taylor conducted by Rick Marshall in 2016, who stated they were taking their time developing the film and was hopeful that Del Toro would have time to direct the film. But no official announcement has been made to say that the film has been canceled. So we got just a classic Ryan Johnson Star Wars <laughs> situation. of just like, yeah, it's, it's definitely still happening, everybody. You know, like how Dan Aykroyd kept insisting for decades that Ghostbusters 3 was still going to be made. (laughs) (laughs) It was just frustrating for fans. The idea of Guillermo del Toro doing a Haunted Mansion movie just on paper seems like such an instant slam dunk. He's a huge fanboy. We know he makes great films. He'd be able to capture the tone of this so perfectly. Why are you letting this slip through your fingers? I mean, to put this in perspective, this was originally announced at Comic-Con 2010 at the end of the Tron Legacy panel. Tron Legacy was originally announced two years earlier at Comic-Con 2008, and it was in theaters December 2010. By that trajectory, we should have gotten the GDT Mansion movie a decade ago. Yeah. We kept waiting and waiting and waiting. When I did my videos, finally uploaded my Haunted Mansion videos in the spring of 2016, shortly before my third video came out, Guillermo del Toro tweeted that it was still in development, that we're still working on it, we're on the fourth draft now, So I took that as, well, hopefully we'll see what happens now that a completely different Haunted Mansion movie is set to be released next spring. Of course, that's not happening anymore, but we'll get to that. Yeah. So bear with me for just a moment because I'm going to go into basically my conspiracy (laughs) of what happened afterwards. Okay. Okay. So something that I wanted to address is that there is this claim that Crimson Peak is the Haunted Mansion movie that Del Toro made because Disney didn't make his Haunted Mansion movie. I may or may not have said that it was in my video of it. (laughs) The project's been stuck in development hell for so long that Guillermo basically just went ahead and made a Haunted Mansion movie without Disney. The first time I saw a trailer for Crimson Peak, I was like, oh, so he's just making the Haunted Mansion movie without Disney. Okay. (laughs) Yeah. But for me, it doesn't line up. Yes, the two movies feature a mansion, 
But we did learn that in his script, there was going to be multiple mansions. There's the Hatbox Ghost. And in Crimson Peak, the mansion and even the story kind of falls closer to the fall of the House of Usher. It doesn't really line up there. I know Del Toro, when he was promoting Crimson Peak, he kept saying, look, the studio's trying to sell this as a horror movie. It's really not a horror movie. It's a gothic romance. Yeah. Whereas, you know, he was fully intending the Haunted Mansion movie to be a horror movie. Yeah. Or at least as best as he could make under Disney with a PG-13 rating. Exactly. So there are some like surface level similarities. So like there's victims with butcher knives in their heads. Tom Hiddleston is basically constant hatchway. There's a ghost that plays piano and there's a ballroom dance scene. There are two pieces of evidence that this might be the Haunted Mansion reincarnate. And that is the fact that Del Toro's writing partner, Matthew Robbins, also wrote the script for Crimson Peak. Hmm. And then there is one scene where the hallway wallpaper has the exact same wallpaper design used in the Haunted Mansion ride. That might have been just an in-joke reference, though. Yeah, you know, that- I think so, too. Like I said, that's the most concrete evidence that I could find was that. You said earlier that Guillermo del Toro said that he was having problems cracking the story. What if this was a draft that he wrote that was just like, ah, this just does not feel like the Haunted Mansion movie I want, but there are some good ideas here. And so kept working on that draft. It may have started from the same place of Haunted Mansion, but I don't want this to be the Haunted Mansion. I'm going to make this my own movie and go off into my own direction with this. I could also see that somebody who's that big of a fan of Haunted Mansion really wants to make sure he does it exactly right. And I could see that being a big element in why it didn't get made if he is obsessing over trying to make the perfect script and it just never quite meets his own expectation. Instead, he says, well, there is still this very good version, so I'll keep working on this and adapt it into something else. I could see that being part of this starting point as well. It could be. I mean, Dan, like you said, the script for the GDT version has sadly never leaked, but I do get the impression just because it was in development for so long that there was probably one or two specific elements about the script that Disney was just not on board for. That they just really thought, no, that's going a little too far with it. That's a little too dark for us. Can you tone it down? And GDT just didn't want to tone it down. At least I imagine that's probably what happened. Yeah. Can we just get like a little less incest? (laughs) (laughs) Well, I mean, in particular, after The Shape of Water won Best Picture and he won Best Director and the awards darling that year that won everything... At that point, I was like, okay, now can we have our Haunted Mansion movie from this guy? It's like, (laughs) now that they can put from Academy Award winner Guillermo del Toro on the poster, it's like, now it seems like even more of a slam dunk. Could you maybe? uh, uh, No. I also do think Disney was holding out for del Toro to direct it. I think so too, yeah. That seems like another possibility for me is that maybe Disney said, look, we'll make the movie if you give up this other project that you really want to do and come direct this. And maybe del Toro just didn't want to not make Pacific Rim or something. And he was faced with a Sophie's Choice or something. (laughs) He wasn't all that interested in directing it he just wanted to produce it maybe that was a deal breaker for disney who knows yeah because i read through that whole interview Graham taylor he seemed very hopeful he's like you know he'll come back when he's ready yeah (laughs) he will he sounded like one of those mothers who will apologize for their child no matter what they do and be like he's a good boy (laughs) he's a good boy don't worry he'll come back he'll he'll direct the movie (laughs) i remember an interview from that comic-con 2010 after the announcement where an interviewer asked him What is your favorite part of the Haunted Mansion? What is your favorite part of the ride? Oh. My favorite moment is a very freaky moment, actually. Because when you come out of the elevator, if you wait in the portrait gallery and you let the group go, the group you were in, there's about three minutes between elevators. And the moment when you are alone in the portrait gallery with no one behind you and no one in front of you, it actually is very scary. When this script was in development, having tremendous access to the ride and he would get to ride it by himself with no line and just examine all the little details early in the morning before the park opened. I mean, that's just a fanboy's dream right there. (laughs) 
I imagine that his room of all the other collectibles like doubled afterwards because like <laughs> access to all that stuff and be like, can I keep this? Oh, yeah. Can I yeah, get yeah. a copy of this? <laughs> Can I get this? <laughs> <laughs> Stealing the paintings <laughs> off the wall. I'm just going to borrow this if you don't mind. Guillermo, why are you wearing that huge trench coat? <laughs> what? I, I came in with this. What, what are you talking about? <laughs> this, uh, to me, is um, a dream come true, and I hope to steal as many props as possible. <laughs> but to further go down with my theory, I don't know, maybe this is just the writer's covering up to be like, no, it's not Haunted Mansion. They did kind of over explain what their inspirations were, which is a long list of stuff. They said it was Robert Wise, The Haunting, Emily Bronte's Wuthering Heights, Charles Dickens' Great Expectations, Daphne Du Maru's Rebecca, Charlotte Bronte's Jane Eyre, Jack Clayton's The Innocents, Joseph Sheridan La Fanu's Uncle Salas, even the main character, who is Edith Cushing, is an homage to Edith Wharton, who wrote The Age of Innocence, and Peter Cushing, who was the actor who portrayed Frankenstein's monster. Mm -hmm. Just to play devil's advocate, I will say that while writing Crimson Peak, Robbins may have had the haunted mansion idea just swirling around in his brain, and anything that was put into Crimson Peak, I think, might not have been deliberate. But I think elements of it may have fallen into the script just by happenstance. Sure. On August 28th, 2020, it was announced that Katie Dippold, who wrote the 2016 Ghostbusters reboot, she also wrote The Heat and was a writer for Parks and Rec, she was writing a script for the new Haunted Mansion movie under the production company Rideback, who also did Terminator Salvation, the Sherlock Holmes movie, the Lego movie, and Lego Batman movie. They also did the new It movies and the live action Aladdin. In July 2021, it was official that Justin Simeon would direct, who is known for directing Dear White People and Bad Hair, and is actually currently working with Lucasfilm in creating a Lando Carizian solo series. Nice. Hmm. I didn't realize that he was attached to Solo. I knew that was something they were working on. Yeah. But. I think this was pretty recent when they announced that. Yeah. Uh, which is why I included that in there because I thought it was really neat. The filming is complete and was primarily shot on location in New Orleans and is set to release March 10th, 2023. There has been somewhat of a synopsis that's been thrown out there. I don't know how official this is, but from what I gathered, it's a doctor and single mother who is portrayed by Rosario Dawson and her nine-year-old son, who is Chase Dillon. They move in into an unusually affordable mansion in New Orleans. After some strange going-ons, they contact a priest, played by Owen Wilson, but when they're overwhelmed, he enlists the aid of a widowed scientist-turned-failed paranormal expert, who is played by Lakeith Stanfield, a French Quarter psychic, played by Tiffany Haddish, and a crotchety college history professor, played by Danny DeVito, to help exercise the mansion. I am on board for this cast, and particularly Lakeith Stanfield is one of my favorite actors right now, and he's the kind of actor that I feel like always chooses good movies to be in. Like, he's got a very good sense of picking good films, so that gives me a lot of hope that this is going to be a good movie. Yeah. <laughs> I love the cast in this thing. I'm on board for anything Danny DeVito's in, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> I was never that big a fan of Owen Wilson, but I loved him in Loki. Yeah. Maybe middle-aged Owen Wilson. He's finally ripening, as it were. We're going into a will son Yeah, 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 yeah. He, maybe <laughs> Owen Wilson is finally ripe now. Like, he's good. The involvement of Tiffany Haddish and Justin Simeon as the director, I don't want to leap to a, any conclusions before I've seen the movie, obviously, but it does feel like between that and the Eddie Murphy movie, it seems like somewhat at Disney really wants to turn the Haunted Mansion into, quote unquote, a black franchise, which I don't have a problem with at all. I just don't quite see the connection. If this is going back to the antebellum style mansion, maybe that's something they're actually going to get into with this movie. Mm -hmm. Maybe. The plot of the Eddie Murphy movie, what's really going on is that the master of the house had wanted to marry this girl who happens to look exactly like Eddie Murphy's wife, but she's black. So, of course, the implication there is, 
oh, the master wanted to marry one of his own slaves, but they never straight up said that. Yeah, yeah. interesting. And we find out that the butler, played by Terrence Stamp, Ramsley, he poisoned the girl so that he couldn't marry her, and he was so distressed with guilt that he hung himself. I really feel like at some point that was going to be a much more prevalent theme in the 2003 movie, but then Disney probably got cold feet and we're like, eh, don't make it so blatant. Yeah. yeah. This is the same studio that even when they made a movie with their first black Disney princess, they couldn't actually address racism any more than saying, you know, someone of your background, you know, that was the most they ever got with it. Also, at the same time, they announced this movie in August of 2020. 2020 was, of course, the year of all the George Floyd protests. But, you know, this was right around the time they announced that they were turning Splash Mountain into a Princess and the Frog ride, mm -hmm. which they announced way back in 2020. But apparently it's not actually happening until 2024, 2025. So they clearly just announced the Splash Mountain thing a month after George Floyd was murdered just for the fucking woke brand points. There was no reason they had to announce it that early, except you know, to try to cash in on that fucking zeitgeist. Disney cashing in on woke zeitgeist without actually doing anything meaningful? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that would definitely be a very interesting take on the Haunted Mansion, and it would explain why Justin Simeon is interested in it, because so far, all his films have been explicitly about race. Maybe they are doing a Haunted Mansion movie that's explicitly about America's horrible history of racism. Yeah. yeah. But on the other hand, it is Disney. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but, you know, if there was ever a time when Disney felt like there was profit in saying something, you know, about it and actually not pussyfooting around the issue and actually being a woke brand, it would be in 2020 when they would want to do that sort of thing. And again, this is all conjecture. Maybe the movie's not about that at all. Who knows? Yeah. Again, I don't have a problem with it being about that if it is, in fact, about that. I mean, for decades, the first Pirates movie was really the only really good movie based on a Disney Park attraction. Dead Man's Chest was pretty good, but then the series got worse and worse after that. But then last year, the Jungle Cruise movie with Dwayne The Rock Johnson came out. That was pretty good. I really enjoyed that one. So maybe they're trying to build a whole Disney Park attractions cinematic universe or something. Who knows? I was joking about it earlier, especially knowing how often... They tried to make the rides connected with Pirates of the Caribbean and Haunted Mansion. I would be okay with having those cinematically connected yeah. as well. Yeah, that'd be cool. Just from Disney's point of view, when you look at how well Black Panther did. Oh, yeah. Disney realizes maybe we can make a movie that actually addresses this shit and it would actually work. The fact that the only credited writer is Katie Dippold. Now, I do enjoy Katie Dippold's work. In addition to the movies you mentioned, she also wrote for Parks and Rec for a while. I do actually defend the 2016 Ghostbusters movie as a pretty good movie. I do too. It's not as good as the original. It just got drowned in so much stupid internet drama bullshit that kind of ruined it. But if you go back and actually watch it as a comedy, it works pretty well as a comedy. Oh, it's a great comedy. The fact that they're tapping her for another ghost movie... It does tell me that they want to make this explicitly a comedy. Yeah, and especially with, like, casting Tiffany Haddish. Oh, yeah. And Danny DeVito. You don't put Danny DeVito in something that's not a comedy. No. It gave me the concerns when Tiffany Haddish was cast. It kind of gave me, like, the Eddie Murphy vibes. But I also think about it like this. is like, Tiffany Haddish is like cilantro. You, like, sprinkle her into the movie, and she's going to be great. But you don't make a cilantro salad, <laughs> which is what they did with the original Haunted Mansion movie with Eddie Murphy. Which they kind of had to do because Eddie Murphy was such a name above the title star. But yeah, it's like that's part of my problem with the 2003 Haunted Mansion movie is that it was trying too hard to be an Abbott and Costello meets Frankenstein type comedy about the Haunted Mansion and not like a straightforward Haunted Mansion movie. But on the other hand... I'd be fine with Haunted Mansion being a comedy if it was funny. That was another big problem with the Eddie Murphy movie. It wasn't funny. The attempts at being funny all fell flat. So if it works, it works. And either way, I'm looking forward to seeing it because based on the pedigree involved, it definitely looks at least like it'll be very interesting. Yeah. And yeah. with Justin Simeon on board, I don't know if anyone's seen Bad Hair. I have not, mm. unfortunately. Bad Hair is a legitimately good 
scary movie. Okay. If I were to ever do a double feature of like, I guess, black exploitation horror films, it would be like Get Out and Bad Hair. That's high praise. <laughs> Bad Hair is just incredibly well done. It addresses race in such an interesting way. I know after Get Out came out, there was like a bunch of movies that were like trying to be black horror movies that were clearly a bunch of white executives being like, we got to make our own version of this. And you got movies like Karen, which I didn't see, but I heard was awful. That's what Hollywood does. Once something works and they don't know why, why it works, they instantly try to replicate it. And when Get Out was this massive smash that supposedly came from nowhere, they were like, okay, we got to let black people do horror movies, which on the one hand is such a lazy takeaway from Get Out. But on the other hand, think of the possibilities. Oh, yeah, you know? yeah for sure. Oh, yeah. Should we also talk about Muppets Haunted Mansion? Yeah. Yeah, let's bring that up because <laughs> the Muppets Haunted Mansion, when did that come out? That came out last October, last Halloween. I mean, I already covered that on my podcast last Halloween when the randomizer was kindly enough to pick it. And it's really fucking good. It's so good. Yeah, it's a lot of fun. I will say it's more of a Muppet special than a Haunted Mansion special. But as a Muppet special, it's one of the best Muppet things to come around in a long, long time. It is. Oh, yeah. It just filled me with so much glee to watch it. It was great. (laughs) (laughs) A lot of good classic Muppety bits, but they also did a lot of cool stuff with like trying to have a message to it at the end that was like actually pretty meaningful, which is not something I expected out of that. By making Gonzo the lead character of it, I mean, Gonzo's always been my favorite Muppet, so obviously I welcome that. And then actually making a comment on insecurity of people, you know, being afraid to face their own fears. And your real fear is that I need to constantly do this crazy stuff because that's why people like me. It was way more poignant than I ever would have expected, but a terrific special, highly recommended. It's on Disney Plus now. Go check it out. Yes. Even if the Justin Simeon movie ends up sucking, we've still got Muppets Haunted Mansion. So (laughs) there you go. Well, that's going to go ahead and wrap us up. Thank you, everybody, for listening. And thank you, Tony, for being on the show with us. My pleasure. If people want to find more of what you've got going on, where can they find that? You can follow me on Twitter at Tony Goldmark, and you can watch my old videos on my YouTube channel, youtube.com slash Tony Goldmark. And you can listen to my podcast, Escape from Vault Disney, which is on Pipe Dream Podcasts, along with this fine show. Each week we review a movie, a TV episode, or a series of shorts that's available on Disney Plus chosen completely at random. Now, unfortunately, by the time you hear this, it'll be too late to submit any entries, but this August on my podcast, Escape from Vault Disney, will be Patreon Request Month. I've been doing it in September the last two years, but this year I'm doing it in August for the first three weeks or so of July. My Patreon patrons over at patreon.com slash Tony Goldmark were able to submit requests for topics to cover on Escape from Vault Disney. And throughout August, we will have the randomizer select five of those patron submitted requests to cover on the show. So every week will be someone's request. We just don't know whose. So check that out in August. And also at the website, pipedreampodcast.com, you can find more episodes of this show, as well as Come On Fahuguapods and the recently wrapped up Mystery Shack Look Back. And we will have, coming out next month in August, we will have the official launch of Pod Made You Special, a VeggieTales rewatch journey. Thanks to our wonderful patrons who have helped get us to that goal to be able to create that as a monthly show. And I'm very excited for you all to check this out. You can also find us on social media. We are on Instagram at How Did This Not Get Made. We're on Twitter at HDTNGM. And you can send us your emails, notgetmade at gmail.com. Send us your suggestions for the next season. Send us any corrections of things we might have got wrong we would love to hear from you so i think that's going to go ahead and wrap us up thanks again everybody for listening thank you this podcast has no windows and no doors which offers you this chilling challenge to find a way out of course there's always my way and then the episode just stops (laughs) there you go (laughs) yeah
to socialize.